I drove six hours up here to entertain you. So I wanted to thank everybody for coming today. I know the weather's a little inclement. Um, for some of the reenactors we're talking this morning as these guys woke up in their tents and where uh, some of the guys were sitting down in the bunkers in the trench, which you go check out later. Um, and everyone's walking around wet and slop full of mud. And they said, this is perfect World War One weather. Because uh, whenever people think of uh, World War One, they think of dark, very cold, no leaves on the trees, very depressing. And um, yeah, it probably is pretty good weather for World War I. that are behind me. I'm dressed as a standard Russian soldier. He's commander. He's exception to rule. I am a exception to rule. This is a typical sized small farm village that you'd find on the Eastern Front. I'm with the American Red Cross from World War I. And the American Red Cross recruited approximately 20,000 registered nurses in the United States to volunteer in the battlefield hospitals and in other positions over there in France in 1917. It was all voluntary, and we were the greatest mother on earth. What you're going to see right here is a battle from 1916 on the Eastern Front. Everybody knows about the Western Front, the trenches, they know about the French, they know about the British and the Americans that fought later in the war. What they don't know so much about is the uh, trials and tribulations of what happened in Russia. Uh, Russia, in both World War I and World War II, took a massive beating uh, from the Germans. And while the Russians have a lot of men, uh, they lack in leadership and they lack in equipment, especially in heavy equipment. So the Eastern Front was hit trenches, but for the most part it was very fluid. You could not defend uh, a thousand to 1,500 miles around the front line. When Turkey entered the war, all of a sudden the Russians were also fighting the Turks. You'll find uh, a battalion of Turks that is intermixed with the Germans uh, as the Allies fighting in the southern section of the Eastern Front. I am portraying the Honorable Champ Clark of Missouri. Uh, he was the leading presidential candidate in 1912 for the Democratic Party, as well as the only Missourian ever elected Speaker of the House. That term was from 1911 to 1919, during World War I. Uh, had I got a few more votes in 1912, I would have been elected president on the Democratic side, but I wasn't, so I'm virtually unknown today. Uh, thank you, Woodrow Wilson. The Russians got involved in the war because they were defending Serbia. Serbia was a little tiny country in the Balkans. Uh, they were unwilling to turn over to the Austro-Hungarians, the people they considered terrorists for assassinating the Archduke Ferdinand. Uh, that one shot, that assassination in, uh, uh, in Bosnia, in Sarajevo in 1914, is what precipitated the entire war that cost uh, somewhere close to 50 million lives. And the Austrians declared war in Serbia when they did not turn over the uh, terrorists. The Serbians knew that they had the protection of Russia, so Russia declared war on Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary uh, had a treaty with the Germans. The Germans uh, came to their aid. As soon as the Germans got involved uh, and the Russians were involved, the Russians had a pact with France that France would attack Germany from the other side so they had to fight a two-front war if Russia was ever attacked or uh, engaged in a war 
with the um, with the Germans. Colonel Patton. Colonel Patton. Colonel Patton. Colonel Patton. Colonel Patton. Colonel Patton. Right. There's a very photograph, a very very uh, well known photograph of me He's in front of uh, this little French tank right here. It's the smallest one of all, but the size of a pickup. And I, and I, would, I, I want you to know that at the time that photo photograph was taken of me in front of that French tank, I was thinking, I've got plans for these things if this ever happens again. And it did. And I did have plans for them. Bigger and better tanks. The Germans found out about it, and they weren't happy with me at all. The Germans decided that they could take out France before the beginning of the large offensive and before the Russians could mobilize because they knew that the Russians would be slow. So they had a plane called the Schlieffen plan to sweep into France and take Paris within a couple weeks. And they'd knock France out of the war. And then they could turn their attention with the full brunt of their army to the Russian front. So they had lightly defended uh, eastern border in East Prussia, which is today Poland. And the Russians actually swept through and ransacked uh, the German countryside. There wasn't much to stand in the way. They mobilized much quicker than the Germans had anticipated, and they could push and outnumber the Germans, you know, 20 to 50 to 1. So uh, their fortunes changed around when Hindenburg and Ludendorff uh, had the victory of Tannenberg, where they surrounded a Russian army because they realized they had very poor coordination between the Russian armies, and they were able to wipe out uh, a good portion of the uh, Russian army, one of the two Russian armies that were in uh, ransacking uh, Eastern Germany. Eastern Germany. Um, but that war continued uh, all the way until 1917, until the Bolshevik Revolution started, and the Russians finally pulled out of the war. And the Germans at that point transferred all of their troops to France to, to try to fight and knock France out of the war prior to the end. But uh, the Americans got involved and basically stemmed any efforts that they could possibly have. And, uh, the Germans were going to lose one way or the other by 1918, and they decided to throw the towel in, in November of 1918. They're uh, pushing through this German town right now, and the Germans are about to come through and see what they can do about uh, throwing them out of their home turf. Well, now we need you to speak. Hi, Bob. I'm on TV. <laughs> when the battle's over, you guys are welcome to come through, especially the kids, go pick up all the brass uh, that's spent. Does your mom even know you're here? Yeah. She does. But the, the brass casings can be very dangerous, so please uh, be cognizant if they don't look like they've been fired or if you shake them, they sound like a salt and pepper shaker, please turn them into a reenactor because the unfired blanks can be extremely dangerous and uh, we want to try to place those up just so nobody gets injured uh, even after they leave the event. And we will give you guys the all clear when that's the case. So again, if you have any questions for the reenactors, catch us afterwards and we'll let you know when it's all clear. Thank you for coming. So the Russian lead, they get battalions of troops as infantry on the front, and they were able to help bolster the infantry units that were already in existence. They were lightly armed, uh, and a lot of the people sort of believed that they had made leaders uh, that were meant for troops, meant for permanent troops, they were not uh, pretty typical of uh, the under-armed uh, and under-equipped uh, Russian infantry battalions. The Germans that you see pushing on the street really were equipped. Uh, they did not go to a steel helmet until after 1916. And uh, they continued to use a steel helmet, which is uh, pretty typical of the stereotypical World War One German. Russian troops are primarily armed with the Mosley guns. The M91 Mosley gun is a 262 round. Uh, it was comparable to the German 8mm Mauser rounds. Uh, it had uh, a very big kick, and uh, the powder loop was pretty good at the range. And it was a weapon. Austro-Hungarians, the Turks, and the Germans kind of won. But uh, 
they were also all the facilities that they were working on. They were like machine guns, like heavy artillery, and they never developed any successful tanks that they used during the war. They also had gas tanks. When they started using gas tanks, they were able to wipe out whole battalions uh, or incapacitate whole battalions by use of gas mask here. Gas mask uh, issue sometimes sporadic with some units. Whereas the Germans and their allies, uh, you know, those who fought on the Western Front, they were equipped with very good gas masks. So the Russians have finally retaken the town and uh, pushed the Germans out. They're searching the bodies, they look for intelligence, they look for maps, any information you can find. Sometimes even what's written in a diary uh, may be helpful for knowing uh, what your enemy is doing and find out about the specific regiments or battalions that are facing you. Beginning of the war, people tend to be on both sides, tend to be a little bit more uh, kind and gentle to each other. As the war dragged down and the war became more brutal, uh, that niceness towards your POWs uh, generally subsided. To be a POW early in the war like this meant that uh, you could be in captivity in horrible conditions in Russian POW camps all the way until 1917. Uh, so keep in mind that most of the peasants that served in the Russian army, they uh, did not have uh, any modern conveniences. So one of the things that they're extremely fascinated by were watches. So they would strip the dead bodies of the Germans uh, for watches especially, because that was considered a luxury good that they could never get access to back home. Even after the Soviets took power uh, and they had uh, centralized economies, they wrist, wrist watch production, they tried to boost it so every Russian citizen could have one, but they're still hard to come by by World War II, so they're still a prized possession uh, during World War II. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out today. Give us a minute to police up and uh, clear our weapons, and uh, we'll give you an off there when you guys can come on out.